Hey guys, welcome back to our weekly show that we're going to try to have every Friday. And I'm Eric Valentino, as you met last week, and I have a special guest today, Captain Wendy Marshall. Wendy, say hello, please. Hello to everybody out there, and we hope to give you some information that will make you a better fisherman or fishing woman. And the name of the show is the Galveston Bay Fishing Show. And as I said, we're going to try to come to you every Friday. And as we talked about last week, we're going to try to bring a special guest to the show every once in a while. We don't know how many times we're going to do that, but we will be doing it for sure. The first person I wanted to bring on the show is Captain Wendy Marshall. We're going to do an exclusive interview with Wendy. Wendy has no idea what I'm going to ask him, do you? Not at all. And he, he was notified of this interview and accepted about two hours ago. That's right in. That's true. You can tell how excited he is. But as a recap of what we talked about last week, this is a show that is at this point exclusively about Galveston Bay fishing. And we want to bring you information, knowledge from uh, not only myself, but Captain Wendy, Captain David Dillman, my father, and today Captain Wendy is going to give us some of his information. We appreciate it, Captain Wendy. You're more than welcome. I will try to make sure the audience understands what I'm talking about and help, you know, hopefully it will make them lots better fishermen. And not only that, but also create a fervor for fishing and maybe inspire you to fish more, boat more, you, your family, your friends, all those sorts of things. So without further ado, Captain Wendy, the first question I have for you is, tell me how you got into fishing. Well, when I got out of the service, I came back and I started fishing for, you know, I like to fish. And I didn't know anything about it. And they had a trout run over at Dollar Point that everybody there was catching fish but me. Tell them what a trout run is. A trout run is when you have days after days after days of nothing but humongous catches of trout because there might be 50,000 trout in one area feeding for two or three weeks in a row. Anyway, I got in, uh, the challenge was was trying to catch a fish. And I just started practicing and talking to people and following the people, did everything I could to make, uh, make myself a decent fisherman. And then when I, the reason why I started guiding was because all my friends I used to take fishing were mooches. They would never pay no money. Uh, they wouldn't help bait. Uh, they wouldn't help buy the bait. They wouldn't help put no gas. Back then I could go fishing for twenty dollars, and they would give me a dollar, and I had to furnish the either eighteen or nineteen more. And then they wanted half the fish. And after a while, I said, "That's baloney. I'm gonna keep my own fish." Well, let's dive back into one thing though. How did you get started in the fishing before the service? You went fishing, is that correct? Or no? A, a neighbor a neighbor of mine was a builder. His name was T.E. Braswell in Pasadena. He had a house on Bastrop Bow at a place called Hoskins Mound. I was 14 years old, and he took me out in his boat to a place called Christmas Point and took me trout fishing. And the first trout I caught was about 16 inches, and I thought that was the prettiest thing I ever seen. I mean, just beautiful fish. And, uh, you know, that's what got me started. I got hooked. In fact, when we came in that night, he wanted us to go to bed, and I wanted to fish on his dock. Yeah. Uh, mosquitoes and all, and I still wanted to fish. I know a lot about those sorts of evenings, as you well know. I yeah. grew up spending a night down here, here at Eagle Point, and I would fish on our docks off of our fishing pier at the time off of the bulkhead and the lights the mosquitoes and it was all fun wasn't it yes you get addicted it's an addiction that is it's a good addiction <clears throat> it's just like playing golf you get addicted to chasing that little white ball around i got addicted to trying to catch those rascals and a lot of times they win so let me ask you this some of the viewers don't know where are you from I was, I'm from Tennessee. I lived there till I was six. Uh, and then I moved to uh, Texas. I lived in Texas all my life since then. Where at? 
I mean, where, Pasadena. What high school did you go to? Deer Park High School. I lived uh, in Pasadena, but I went to Deer Park High School. Okay. And uh, we used to, I used to ride my Cushman Eagle down to Kima and fish on a pier called Key Largo, where Jimmy Walker's used to be. And I love saltwater fishing. It, there wasn't any lakes around here close enough for me to go to. So I love the saltwater fishing. And I know this isn't something you like to brag about, but I believe the viewers would find this very interesting. Tell them about your archery, if you don't mind. Well, my parents got into archery <clears throat> as a sport and it was a combination they wanted to get my brother and myself into something that we could participate in as a family and it was archery and I started shooting a bow when I was probably nine or ten and when I was 18 and 19 I was lucky enough to win the state championship in archery I was state champion for two years from Deer Park High School Deer Park and if Back then it was called, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, freestyles when you use a sight. I was uh, uh, just in the regular division. That is amazing. But I, Sh it, shooting it, it a takes it, it just takes practice, that's all. And going back to the fishing, you did answer this already, but could you just restate that one more time? What is it that you fell in love with? And, and the reason why I like this question for you is because we have a lot of customers. I think that you would agree with this that we talk to that they say, I like fishing or they may love fishing, but they haven't, they haven't been able to get somebody else to fall in love with fishing yet. What do you think was the key for you? And what do you think might be key in getting somebody else into fishing? Well, what made me fall in love with fishing was the fact that when I'd get up early, I'd always get a chance to see the sunrise. I could smell salt water, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, come down to the bay one time and smell. You can smell salt water, and it's really a tremendous feeling to see a sunrise, get that smell of just salt water, and the challenge of trying to catch those fish. And I know it sounds <laughs> dumb, but, uh, you know, fish are just dumb animals <laughs> swimming around. <laughs> but I got a kick out of seeing that, uh, that cork go down and feel that fight on the other end. And, of course, I like to eat fish. Uh, I've always tried to make it a practice when I fish for myself. I try to catch enough fish to eat. And uh, I would always try to get a limit, of course. But what I would do a lot of times is I'd give my neighbors who had never had the opportunity to fish, give them a few fish to eat. And uh, I made a habit of taking this old folks home, some fresh fish down there, whole, and then they wanted me to start playing for them. <laughs> Deal was off then, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's excellent. And I think that that would apply for a lot of people, especially as they catch fish like you started to catch fish. Once you catch those fish, and then you start to bring everything all together, it is something that a lot of people fall in love oh, with. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's an experience, let me tell you. Uh, I think it's a great sport. It's a good, clean sport. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit expensive, just a little, when you talk about an $80,000 boat <laughs> and things like that, but uh, it's overall, it's a great, great sport. Do you mean boats weren't $80,000 when you got your first boat? My first boat was a 12-foot John boat, but uh, to show you what, how uh, things have changed. How old were you then? I was 16. And then after the service, what was the size of your first boat? <laughs> it was a 14-foot uh, tri-hole. I sunk it in Galveston Bay chasing a shrimp boat. The reason why I ask you that is I would love for you to expound on there are people that say they can't catch fish because they don't have the biggest boat or the right size boat or, you know, various obstacles. And I've always told people that I caught probably more fish overall in my lifetime fishing from one of these 
the bank? No, these little flat bottom work barges sure, that we sure. build. So at Eagle Point, we always have or has have always had a flat bottom work barge, and it's just a, a wood platform with foam underneath it. And I caught fish like crazy up and down this shoreline, and it was drum and sheephead and sand trout and croaker and and this still can be done. It's just now you take the bigger boat and you drive all over the bay, right? So so tell me tell us about your boat, your small boat. My small boat, I had a 14 and 16 footer, and I caught a tremendous amount of fish in it because I didn't have that big of an engine. I had a 25 horse engine, and it would I could go in the shorelines, and that's where I had to fish with shorelines because it wasn't big enough to go out in the big bay when the wind was blowing. And I learned how to fish around structure of the shorelines, pier pilings, rocks, reefs. And I learned how to fish underneath bait when I saw schools of mullet or shad. And you, that's just something, when, when you go fishing, you should learn something every time you go. You know, I've been fishing now 50 years and I still learn stuff when I go to this day. Do you think somebody could take what you just said and do it today? If they would take it serious, yes. I agree. The uh, You're supposed to learn what you do, you know. Uh, you know, all your athletes, no matter what sport it is, they don't start out being good. They, they practice. Fishing is practice and learning. Uh, when you can learn, if you're going to have a bigger boat and go out in the, the bay anywhere from a mile, at, mile to a mile, you know, further, you need to know the structure you're fishing underneath the water. You've got to know the structure or you're just, it's, you're guessing. Fishing is 80% skill and 20% luck as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty good <laughs> estimate as far as I'm concerned. Next question I have, Captain Wendy, is how did you turn the love of fishing into one of the most successful fishing guide businesses ever. And, and there are people that do not know that you had one of the most successful fishing guide businesses ever. Can you tell us about the guide service that was known as Gulf Coast Guide Service? The Gulf Coast Guide Service, I started it. The truth was to be able to go fishing and somebody else pay for it. And I would take customers out, and I'd take two, three people, no more than three. And back then, I took nothing but doctors and lawyers and businessmen. And I charged $125 a day. Uh, and we back, back, time, back when a quart was $10, right? No. No, $8. <laughs> quart was $2. Oh, God. Okay. No joke. <laughs> I'm telling my age now. But anyway... <laughs> The, uh, I learned that I, I would watch people when I would take them fishing and I would get, I'd get the biggest kick out of watching a 50 or 60 year old man then when I was only in my 20s get so excited of catching that fish and oh, look yeah. at it and yeah. say oh yeah a three pound fish and go oh god look at that beautiful fish you know and I could see that it's a different type of entertainment it's a different type of enthusiasm that fishermen have compared to other sports. Do you have to be a guide to take people out and, and, and then see and, and you experience that sort of reward? In other words... No, you don't have to be a guide at all. Uh, a guide is a person that furnishes a boat for other people to tear up. <laughs> no, but anyway. Uh, what it is, the... You're trying to make money. You're trying to make enough money to pay for that wear and tear on that boat and the expense of the bait, gas, and et cetera. Usually you furnish the equipment, and nowadays equipment is usually a good rod and reel, a, a $300 to $400 setup if you furnish good equipment. You don't have to be a guide. I haven't, right now I'm not guiding, but I take people fishing that are friends, and uh, when I do put them on fish, they get the biggest kick out of catching their fish. That's my question. So you still get the same oh, yeah. and you don't have to be a guide. So where I'm going with that, and I love the way Wendy answered that question is, you have a boat or you are thinking of getting a boat, 
there are few things that are as rewarding as watching the people oh, yeah. you take catch fish. I mean, it's awesome. And ultimately, there will be people that wonder what happened to the guide service. And so, if you don't mind telling them, you know, I, I know why you closed the guide service, but, but Wendy ended up having a very successful mail business, and the, the, the mail business took, took his took all his time and his attention. So would you mind just telling him how you went from the guide business and that, that you eventually moved on to something else? I started a mail business and my fishing business subsidized the income in my mail business the first year. 22 years later, I was making a large amount of money, I'll say it like that. But it took a lot of my time up. I could only fish about four to five days a week instead of seven because of my mail business. Well. I could see the handwriting on the wall with the internet and Facebook and computers and I guess the first people to fall in the mail business was your delivery drivers, your hot shots. I could see that the mail business was going to be going away, uh, was going to be cut down to half of what it was when I was at it. So I had a chance of opportunity to sell my business and I sold it for a good amount of money. And when I did that, I started fishing full-time, uh, I mean full-time, full-time, seven days a week. And then <clears throat> I made a mistake of, can I say it on air, about gambling? <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> anyway. But you, we don't need to go there. But anyway, yeah. I started gambling and it took up a lot of my time. It took up a lot of my money, too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so here I am now. But I still teach people how to fish and where to go. And what do you advise? We'll, we'll dive back into this question in a little more detail. But for, and I think you've answered a lot of my next question already. But for somebody that's thinking about getting a boat, going into fishing, they're hesitant. Is it going to be worth it to them, the money, the time invested? What would you say to somebody that's starting out? The people that you see come in here and they're fishing just very rarely off of a pier and they're thinking about a boat. What, what would be your general advice right now? And we'll go more into more detail in a minute. If you're thinking about buying a boat, I don't know what your price income, I mean what your income is and what price range you can have, but always start out very inexpensive at first to see if you really like this sport. Don't dive into a fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollar boat motor trailer when you can buy a used boat motor trailer anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand, and in some cases even cheaper. You want to see if you really like this sport because to be good at fishing, you have to work at it, some physically and a whole bunch mentally and studying, studying maps, studying the weather, the tides, the barometer. Uh, and then in some cases actually watching other people catch fish and you try to learn why they're catching them and you're not. Uh, you know, I've done that. I've, I've watched other people catch fish. Do you think, for the person that's just getting into fishing, do you think it's a better investment to take money and apply it to a more expensive boat or save that money buy a less expensive boat and take the money you saved on the less expensive boat and putting it into a premium storage situation, for example, like an Eagle Point fishing camp, like a, like a slip with a lift. And the, the, the membership, the camaraderie that you get around the dock, the fish cleaning table, what, what do you think? Because I run into this a lot. They spend a lot of money on the boat motor trailer they, they're not part of a community such as ours or like a yacht basin, and then they can't catch any fish. What's your feedback on that? Because you've almost always had your boat in a slip with a lift. I know that about right. you. If you're going to take fishing serious and you plan on fishing once or twice a week, about eight to ten months out of the year, then you go with a less expensive boat and you get yourself a shed close to the water, or you get yourself a slip where you can 
hang around people that catches fish and talk to them. Most people will be glad that I'll help you out in some way. Says, they won't always give you the exact spot they catch fish. A lot of people are closed mouth, but they will <laughs> brag on they how brag. they fish. They love to brag. They got to brag. They got to brag. I mean, that's <laughs> the whole thing. Do they love I to caught, brag or what? Oh, yeah. The fish I, I caught a fish that big. And you yeah. go over there and it's that big. <laughs> well, and, and how many times does it go from, well, I'm catching them over here. Well, really, I'm catching them right here. I mean, I'm really catching them right here. Fishermen have a tendency to exaggerate. I mean, I've even caught myself. I caught myself lying one time, and I got caught in it <laughs> by telling the people where I went that I really didn't go there. I was about 10 miles away from there. Uh, the... Uh, you got to remember about fishing. Nowadays, Houston is so the freeways and your major your major arteries of transportation. For, I mean, for your transportation, is always under construction. So it, it's better to get a, a, a some kind of storage or something close to the water if you're at a great distance away. Now, if you're three or four miles from the bay, that's fine. Keep your boat there. It's your house or whatever. But if you're, you know, in Houston or somewhere where it's really hard to pull your boat down that freeway and taking the chance of somebody stopping in front of you and pulling in front of you and having an accident, it's well worth the peace of mind of having your boat in an area where you can just go down there, get in your boat, or go down there and load your boat up and go 50 yards to go fishing. Saves so much time, too. Now... We have a question from one of our Facebook listeners and, and viewers. What, and, and by the way, honey, feel free to send question, you know, additional questions to us, okay? Okay. Through Facebook. If you have a question, like one of our viewers or listeners, put it on Facebook and we'll try to get it from Captain Wendy right now during this session. Yeah. But one of the viewers have asked, what's your best fishing memory? <laughs> the very I know there's best, a bunch of them. No, I'll, I'll tell you the very. Is it the forty trout we caught at Redfish Island that one time? No, there's... that's one of them. But the it's, okay. I had a. Look, he's getting excited. <laughs> Go ahead. I had a fishing trip for Saturday, and the man canceled on Wednesday. So I turned around and told the bait camp, and it wasn't this one; it was uh, one down at the dike that I, my customer didn't sh uh, cancel. And he said, I'll give you a trip. So he gave me a trip. Guy showed up. We go up in Trinity Bay. We catch eight. This is when the limit was 80. I mean 20. We had 80 trout, and we had 30 of them over 7 pounds. The best fishing trip I ever had in my life. And... We came in, I was excited, and I asked him how much, man, did you like his trip? They said, we like we like noodling better. <laughs> and I said, what is that? I didn't know what that was. Oh, man. They said, you stick your arm underneath the river bank and grab a catfish and pull it out. I thought they were pulling my leg, but they were true. You know? <laughs> this one man caught two, I, I never did, I have, okay, I've never caught a nine pounder. I caught a 10. I caught about 48 pounders, but I've never caught a nine. This guy in the front of the boat catches two nine pounders back to back. His buddy next to him catches a nine pounder. Everybody caught a nine pounder in that boat today, but me, and I caught three or four eight pounders. It's just a big school of big fish in November. We got back in, and I'm we're, I'm getting pictures and all this other stuff. And they said well, we got to go. We got to catch our flight back to Little Rock. And I said okay. <laughs> So they write something on a check, and they put the check in my pocket. So I told my buddy, Marshall Deal, I said, hey, tell me how big, how much of a tip I got. Did I get a $50 tip? <laughs> Marshall pulls it up, and he starts laughing, and tears is coming down. And he turned the check around, and it had on the back of it, thanks for donating this trip to God. Oh, my God. What? It was three Baptist preachers from Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh, boy. Now, what it was... <laughs> I gave away a free trip to the GCCA. And the man that bought it 
was down at the Texas City Dock at that marina. Curls. Yeah. And he never did take it for three years. So he called his guys up to take the trip and didn't <laughs> tell me. I bet that's that. the last time you did that. I never donated another trip to nobody. This is this is <laughs> the trip that Wendy well, we went on many trips, but this is the trip where remember that? Yeah. We go out there at right at daylight. We go to Redfish Island before the Redfish Island sunk. And Eric was home on leave from LSU University with his buddy there. And I and I told Johnny, come on too. Johnny didn't want to go. He just wanted Eric and his. I said, no, come on, Johnny. I, I told him, I said, we'll be through by 10. We got out there and we worked for maybe 15, 20 minutes before I found the fish. Was it that long? Tell the story. The way the story went is we went to the south end of Redfish Island. Redfish Island used to be roughly three or four times larger than the one that's out there now. That little play island that they built is nothing. Redfish Island used to be huge. The island went underwater, it sank, and that became one of the best fishing spots ever. 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 For uh, from eight years. Eight. Yeah, from what? Early, uh, excuse me, late 80s, early 90s to about 2000, what, three? Three, four. And we go out to the south end, and we had no bites over the course of about 10 minutes. Wendy says, okay, everyone in. We pull our lines in. Wendy gets the anchor in, and Wendy just starts driving his Roballo really slow down the approximately mile-long underwater reef of what is known as Old Redfish Island. We get to the north end of Redfish Island, and Wendy goes, Hey, there are the fish right there. And my friend from South Louisiana, from Homa, he's like, What is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, What do you see, Wendy? And he goes, Hey, there's a slick right there about the size of the top of a five-gallon bucket. And I knew by fishing with Wendy so many times and Sam Barcelona and stuff, I, I look and I go, yeah, 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 there's a slick right there. And we set the anchor and, you know, it's the overly used expression, but yeah, it was Ever it cast. was 40 trout in a row. Ever cast. And my friend from South Louisiana caught his biggest trout ever on, on that trip. Yeah. Caught a, about a seven pounder. So let's, let's those, talk conditions. Those are good. Well, I do. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. that's all. No, that's it. I was uh, going to say. What about this weekend? I do want to ask one other question. Tell the viewers about your attractive fish business and how you got into that. Well, when I was a guide, uh, I made up my mind that when I was a guide that I uh, would take people fishing and I wouldn't be picky. I would take anybody that wanted to catch a fish, man, woman, children, whatever. Uh, a lot of the guides would only want to take a couple of men fishing, they're good fishermen. I took people that never fished in their life. So what I did was, over a period of time now, not not right away, I developed, uh, well Marshall Deal came up with this, this weight, I came up with the color, and I started experimenting with painting it, using fingernail polish, everything in the world. This right here is liquid rubber, and uh, I wanted to be able to take a 12-year-old girl, her use a spinning rod, cast it out 30 feet, her pop it, and her catch a fish. And I found out that fluorescent orange and fluorescent pink and, that, and chartreuse is a fantastic colors for attracting fish. This trout rig that I make has five different ways to attract fish. And... Uh, now there are people that's become an eagle point. They have purchased these and they're going out and they've caught two or three fish on it and just tickles them to death because before this they never caught anything. All your pre, pre-made trout rigs at the present time, every one of them are using the colored, the fluorescent colors that I came up with 
40 years ago. Mm. Hey, what are the five ways it attracts fish? All right. I'll show you. First way is the live shrimp on the hook, swimming. The second way is the pink bead on the leader. See this pink bead right here? Yeah. I'll take my glasses off. Can't see. Anyway, the pink bead. That's the second way. The third way is the fluorescent orange, pink, or chartreuse flashing it. It glows underwater, especially when it's sunlight. It will, looks like a little ball of fire underneath. That's the third way. The fourth way is this cup on this styrofoam float. When you, uh, th by the way, this is a matched weight for this float. It pulls the water up to this line right here. When you pop it, it will make a slurping noise. You know, just the way a trout does. When a trout comes to the surface to feed, he goes, and that's exactly the way they sound. And then the last one, the fifth way, is the rattle. Can you hear that? I hear it. Oh, yeah. Now, that right there, uh, I did not come up with the rattles. There was a few people that had floats, plastic floats, hard plastic floats, with rattles. And they caught a few fish, so I, I decided I'm going to try it. <laughs> I mean... Like you said, Kyle. every opportunity you take, every opportunity there is to, to try to outsmart that speckled trout. And in my case, this has worked very well because I used to take a, a doctor and his wife and his two daughters. I'm using that as an example, fishing. I'd furnish the, the ladies uh, spinning rods, and the doctor wanted me to actually babysit while he fished. And I took care of the wife and the two girls. They would cast her rod and reel. You know, like I said, 20, 30, 40 feet out and pop it. That's all they had to do. And they would catch their own fish. They did it all on their own. I would refuse to cast a rod and reel, pop the cork, catch a fish, and give it to a customer. I am not going to do that. Maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I'm not going to do that. You're going to have to catch a fish yourself. Uh... Does that make sense? Absolutely. We do have a question. Okay. Somebody would like to know from Facebook, how do you and have you been able to get women to fish with you? <laughs> well, I presume, honey, is this by a male viewer? <laughs> <laughs> the way I've got women fish with me in the past. Is this from a male viewer? Oh, yeah. Okay. The way I got women to fish with me is because when I was single of course I would pick out women I try to date well I would first find out if they like outdoors if there's four or five things on the outdoors they didn't like I would just kind of shun and move on to somebody else I try to find a lady that would like the outdoors and I tried to gradually put it in to perspective to see if they'd like to boat ride and possibly fish. Some women, that's the last thing they ever want to do is go on a boat. But the women that their fathers took them fishing as a kid, uh, they, uh, they were in. When I, they found out that I was a guide and I had a boat and I liked to fish and I wanted to take them fishing on a date. And I take women date on a date fishing. And uh, they, they, they loved it. And then Many, many customers that come in here, the wives are the ones just bringing, is getting their husbands to go fishing with them. Absolutely. That's no joke. I've asked them all the time. My uh, last, go excuse ahead. me, I'm no, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. My last question for you is, what would you consider to be the premium size boat for Galveston Bay? If, and I'm not saying at all that it has to be an expensive boat. An expensive brand but the size if because you've had different sized boats you've had many different boats if you were picking the premium size boat for Galveston Bay fishing not not all this other goofy stuff fishing in three inches of water and all that I'm talking about Galveston Bay what would be the boat you would buy the size if it's for a man his wife and his family between 21 and 
That's my opinion. Then how come? Well, you can still handle a 22-foot boat, the man and the wife together, as far as her backing the truck, truck back. And you're going to say you're, you're trailering the boat. You, she can back it in. You can get in the boat and take it off. It's easy to handle. Uh, a 25-foot boat is for the serious man that's going to be fishing with a lot of men, mostly. Uh, in some cases, you know, you take your family, but the expense nowadays, you can you can save yourself twenty to thirty thousand dollars by just getting a twenty-two foot versus a twenty-five. Okay. When it's too rough for a twenty-five, no, no. When it's too rough for a twenty-two, it's too rough for a twenty-five. I agree with that. Uh, the, the the low profile boats nowadays, there's probably fifteen or twenty different brands. They're so light, you don't need a humongous uh, motor on it. Usually a 200 to a 225 is all you need maximum. And in some cases, a 175. Uh, if you're into the speed, of course, you're gonna try to buy one of these uh, $25,000 engines. To me, that's a waste of money. Uh, what you want for your family is, uh, like I said, between the 21 to 23. And Rebecca? I was just checking out what you guys are doing. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about the bait supply? Well, let's talk about bait supply, forecast for the weekend, what people can expect. And for anyone that's watching, Rebecca is my wife. She is the behind the scenes guru, the producer of the show. <laughs> and honey, we appreciate all your hard work. Hi, so, Wendy, tell the people how you did on Wednesday fishing, and then let's tell people what we've seen in terms of fish, you know, besides your catch, and then what we expect going into the weekend. <clears throat> well, I went out Wednesday, we had 12 trout. We caught them at the wells. I went to the wells two weeks before this, and the water is really off color. And I fished very hard uh, in that west wind. And finally, the wind laid, and then the channel cleared up. Don't waste your time fishing dirty water. You've got to find what we call trout green water, which is lime green, uh, emerald green, and this time of year, you want to be, in my opinion, in deeper water as the day goes on. At daylight, you can be in shallow water, but don't stay there too long. I'll give you an example. Right now, they're catching fish at Todd's Dump at daylight to about 8.30, and then they can't find nothing but stingrays. I'm out going out to the wells, and I'm fishing 12 feet of water, and I'm fishing six feet deep, six feet deep and I'm drifting real slow, trying to find the fish. Now the secret to fishing the wells is you've got to know the structure underneath that well. The structure underneath that well would tell you which way the tide, the current, is gonna run. You always throw your bait in an area where incoming tide, it'll drift over that structure. Outgoing tide, the same thing. Most people can be uh, fishing 25 feet from the right place and never get a bite, and the next boat be catching fish every cast. Absolutely. It's the structure underneath. A hump this tall, that's all. Just a one foot hump on those wells can hold tons of fish compared to flat bottom. And I've seen that. I mean, I, Wednesday, we went out Wednesday, everybody around us not catching anything. And we pulled up, and we didn't we didn't kill them ever cast, but about every 10, 15 minutes, we'd get us a 19 to 21 inch trout. And you said you were roughly six feet deep with shrimp with your rig. Yes. Okay. Now we, here's this is something people don't understand, and I'll try to explain you. When you buy a quart of bait, you have to buy what our shrimper brings us each each month the shrimp changes in size 
and so on and so on, depending on how you, you get more one month versus less the next. What I do, and nobody understands this, is when I pick up shrimp to fish with, I use a, a one, not the very smallest, but one of the smallest shrimps first to try to find the fish. Once I find the fish, I go to a bigger shrimp like this, and I just throw it out and I let him <laughs> swim around. And because you've got to keep him alive. If you start out by using all the big, pretty shrimp and ain't found no fish, by the time you find the fish, all you got is, is little bitty shrimp. Yeah. And that's not good. Also, the real small shrimp, when I got a net, real small ones, I'll put them aside in a bucket. And when I find the fish, I'll pick a little one up, pinch his head a little, and just throw him in the water. Now you think, there's no way. Well, I have done that many a time, throw 15, 20, 30 shrimp, it's called chumming, and hold those fish. I've yeah. actually pulled fish away from other boats to my boat by just throwing out live bait. Now, that gets expensive if you're throwing out good shrimp. You throw out the real little ones that you really can't use. It's not that many, but, it, you know, a few, 10 or 15. And Wendy and I were looking at the forecast for tomorrow, which will be Saturday morning, and then Sunday morning. Right now, the forecast looks great. Fish deep, fish six feet deep, uh, uh, between A lease, A1 and A2. Any well out there you can catch fish on if you just will study it, watch the bait, watch the slicks. The only thing you've got to really watch out for is just idle through the uh, oil fields because right here when there's one or two. Yeah, honey, can you zoom in? Sticking out. So we're here at Eagle Point, and the wells that we're discussing is all in here. Here and here. Big cluster here, big cluster there. And there's also a few wells as you move past past these wells in this area here. All this should be prime right now. And we have seen an increase in catches over the last few days. Now, as far as the bait goes, we have a great supply of live shrimp. We have a great supply of live croakers. We could not say that last Friday. This Friday, we can say that. We're really stocked well for tomorrow morning. So, Wendy and I will be here, and we're going to open at 445. Yes. And don't, hey, don't be afraid to ask some questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Don't feel intimidated. I had to learn. I asked a thousand questions. I still ask questions. Where can they pick up some of these, Wendy? Eagle Point only. That's the only place. Exclusive. Um, where can people watch this on YouTube? The Galveston Bay Fishing Show YouTube channel. And we're going to... Rebecca and I are going to be putting these shows on there, and there will be some other special content that we'll put on there from time to time. But other than that, you'll see us here next Friday. We'll have either Captain Wendy with me or Captain David Dillman with me. And again, send in some information to us on Facebook or email us at eric at eaglepointfishingcamp.com or... Uh, Eric at Galveston Bay Fishing Show.com. Anything else, Rebecca? Eagle Point is where fishermen help fishermen. Absolutely. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching, and we'd love for you to share the show if you like the content that we're delivering. And I do want to thank Wendy for his time, You're his welcome. transparency, and his passion for fishing and helping the customers that come in here. It's extremely hard to find somebody like Captain Wendy Marshall. There's nobody like him in the world. He's here at Eagle Point. Like we said, we'll be glad to help you. And again, again, thank you so much, Wendy. You're more than welcome. Okay. God bless. Have a great Friday night.